just so unexpected. It's one of those you had to be there moment. You had to be there. It subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life. You had to be there. Yeah, that's the latest episode of You Had to Be There here on OTBAM. And Johnny, I can't wait for this. We're gonna we're gonna go in uh, order of, I guess, chronological, chronological when this happened. So we'll start with 2001, and uh, a man that uh, lives long in the memories and uh, as a player and still as a manager with Galway, Port Joyce. Yeah, it's, us. it's lovely to see that. It's lovely to see him referenced again this morning by Lee Keegan and. Um, you know, so many great players, I suppose, don't make managers, but like, I think what Galway achieved this year, and again, history is written by the winners, but Galway were winners this year in many respects to get to the All Ireland final and to produce that performance, which I'll again get to later on in the uh, <laughs> little clip. But uh, so 1998 was kind of. Um, I, I was I was doing my junior cert and I, I don't know what it was because like I, I suppose my upbringing with Galway, watching Galway footballers and the hurlers was like. Failure, constant failure. But yeah. the, the hurlers were kind of because of the makeup of you know the championship. The hurlers at that stage they were never that far off. Whereas with the footballers, like um, you, you're thinking the, the hammers of Mayo got, um, and and then Galway kind of coming as a as a something of a force in in the mid nineties and winning it in ninety eight. And and in ninety eight it felt like it's, there was something special about the the feeling in the county. And as a as a teenager maybe you're romanticising it now but there was something special about it and it was because of players like Porrick Joyce and Michael Donlan from the Dunmore Club from your dad's club and um, I don't know John O'Mahony came in and, and it was it was special subsequently obviously the next couple of years they came unstuck and then the the back door came in in 2001 and um, we'll be talking to a man with strong with strong affinity for Wicklow I think Galway started off in Ockram in 2001 if I remember rightly um, and it culminated anyway in a final against Meath in which they were sort of struggling in the first half and then Porrick Joyce just got 10 points and Porrick Joyce just got 10 points and I remember like uh, Just the 10 points Jesus it was like left and right and I mean we spoke we spoke about this earlier with Colm you do look back in games and I did look back in this game I bought, I bought it as one of these last ditch like Hail Mary DVDs for my brother as a Christmas gift you know when you should have put more thought into it um, a few years ago and watched it back and I was like yeah this, that wasn't quite as good a game as I remember whereas 98 was actually amazing and Galwyn Kildare in 98 was an amazing game but Pori Joyce get 10 points I think Mead got 8 Pori Joyce 17 got 17 points to 8 yeah. 17 points to 8 so you're like um, he was an unbelievable footballer like and the, the Joyce's in general what a what a family with a bunch of characters like love the horses love football real like quintessential North East Galway men I think and uh, his, his talent and it, it was amazing to see him make that step into management because you got to remember like there would have been a lot of probably criticism of Porrick Joyce coming in off Kevin Walsh who himself was a club a county legend and it wasn't it was very very hard for Galway I think to make the transition to a defensive game like it was for a lot of teams but it, it didn't really work in Galway and then to try this year to go back to sort of the roots of maybe the 98-2001 and our old style of football and that day Porrick Joyce was amazing and um, I, I do recall I've said this a few times since reading the Irish Independent the following morning and they're like uh, whoever wrote the article like Galway are basically going to dominate Gaelic football for quite some time now and Galway didn't win a game in Crow Park for another like 17 years or something didn't well, count on the Ulster teams our man own kind no, of game and, then and Kerry of course were, were uh, there always and I, I think as well that um, you know you, I think Galway were inspired by Mayo's failures in 98 but Mayo were getting so close and I think you know Galway maybe then inspired other teams but it, it was very very Galway never really recovered maybe from losing Kevin Walsh to an extent and yeah. obviously when Porrick Joyce himself then got old and the likes of Jaff Allen that was a golden team but uh, that was amazing I was on the canal end that day and um, it just became it, it wasn't like 98 in the sense that it just became a procession but Porrick Joyce performs I was right behind the goal for his whatever point he must have gotten eight points in the second half or something like that <laughs> and um, we just felt like from from this you know sense of being such a downtrodden county now all of a sudden Galway were on top of the world and we had amazing footballers and he was probably the best of them yeah ten points and nine came in the second half apparently for Joyce Mead fell apart like I think he might have been even marking Darren Fay. I trying to remember back now but like Mead were 
Meath had hammered Kerry in the semi and they were well fancied like yeah. um, and Galway were obviously coming Galway were the first backdoor team to win it but um, Porrick as well just yeah they beat Kerry 2-14 two two to 5 points yeah. in the semi and it was kind of I, I do remember 98 Galway were heavy underdogs because um, Kildare had all the hype that year and Galway had only beaten sort of Derry or whatever in the semi and, and the, but the, there was this massive faith in the county but like I think it was it was fitting for John O'Mahony that we came back and won it again and mm. Galway were a long time in the doldrums it, it's funny what you think of when Porrick Joyce hit the 10th point that day we were already going to the bar and celebrating and thinking of next year Galway wouldn't do one for a long time after that and yeah. it'd be beautiful if Porrick Joyce could be the link between the next All-Ireland because um, I got an unbelievable kick out of the All Ireland final this year, even though they lost. Yeah, and we'll get to that one as you say. Like, but if you look at that Meath team that day, <clears throat> uh, Trevor Giles captain, you had Graham Garrity, you had uh, Nigel Crawford, uh, Darren Fay, as you mentioned. But the Galway team: Alan Keane in goals, fullback line: Kieran Fitzgerald, Gary Fahey captain, Richard Fahey, uh, halfback line: Declan Meehan, Tomas Manny, and Sean Dupuy. Kevin Walsh and Michael Donnell in midfield. All almost all playing in '98, like Bar, Bar Richie Fahey, maybe. Yeah. The half forward line is Paul Clancy, Jaff Fallon, and Joe Bergen. And then the full forward line, Derek Savage, Port Joyce, Tommy Joyce, uh, Alan yeah. Cairns and Kieran Comer came on. But what a team. Yeah, what a team. And, um, you know, it's funny, the, the, that team then would, would probably have run aground in the sort of the defensive system that's followed. And I think that, like, this is, Galway people talk about, like, Galway have this kind of, you know, natural style of football. But it's it's more or less true. It mightn't be like to say that, oh, Kerry's, like, Kerry's basically a football county. Galway's a lot going on. But Galway's style of football is is um, is um true to the spirit of the game. And I think th- th- there was a strange um, disassociation between the way the footballers were going and traditional GA men who couldn't yeah. really watch this anymore. And that evaporated last year, like completely gone. And, uh, you know, you see, I'll, t- I'll talk, I'll, I'll nicely kind of bookend this by going back to the final next year and another performance that was arguably better again than Porrick Joyce's. But it's beautiful to watch when it's played well. And that day, Porrick Joyce was probably next to unmarkable. Yeah, and I think a lot of players, <clears throat> even current players, we had Shane Cunningham, the Kilmacall Crooks captain on recently, and he was talking about his dad was from Galway and Porrick Joyce was his hero growing up. Mm. I'd love to know how many footballers around the country at the minute are, were inspired by Porrick Joyce because that wand of a left foot, uh, I'm sure he's inspired plenty of players. Um, so that's Porrick Joyce, 2001 final. Your second pick, Johnny, March 16th, 2002. Uh, so over 20 years ago now but uh, Galway United 2 Derry City 3 the Derry legend Liam Coyle yeah I, I was trying to bring five different sports I think when we'd Vinnie Perth on which is the morning I was on for this I think he may have done five different sports there's Liam Coyle um, and this game was actually this game was in Terry Lamp Park which is probably my favourite like ground in, in the world really because it was just uh, my love of Galway United and just what that place means to you know a League of Ireland fan in Galway but I again like a lot of these. Uh, I got into Galway United in ninety seven, so this was five years later. And a lot of your memories. There was there was one. Um, I was thinking of going for it. It was a goal by uh, Bobby Ryan in Belfield, and probably in front of maybe hundred people. Where, um, I think it was Barry Ryan who was in goal for UCD. He kind of um made a made a made of a hatch for his clearance. And Bobby Ryan with like a half volley from maybe forty five yards just found the top corner, and. Those of us who were there, we sp- still speak about this goal. And I was doing a piece in the match program. It's like so Woodstock. Yeah, you were there you weren't. And it was like, I and then I, I was doing a piece with Bobby Ryan, like kind of a nostalgic piece. And I was like, oh, by the way, like um, <laughs> I had to bring up that goal in Belfield. He couldn't even remember it. No way. He, he, he scored this absolute worldy, like unbelievable goal that would like if a Brazilian scored it, yada yada. He couldn't even remember it, and I was like. Jesus, like I mean, I I was such a limited footballer, and I, I I I if I got a goal like that in training, anyway, so he couldn't remember it, so I was going to put that in, but instead I went for Liam Coyle just because I thought, um, he was a good example of the type of player that in the League of Ireland in those days you you get these incredible talents that for some reason weren't playing at a higher level. Mm. Tony Sheridan was absolutely gifted um, he played for Coventry so he did briefly play at a high level but found his niche back home there are players like that Liam Coyle was one because of injuries like Liam Coyle would have been a top top player I think in England um, but because of injuries he couldn't but that day in Galway and I had to think back Galway United actually got relegated that season um, and Monaghan United finished last Galway United Dundalk and Monaghan United got relegated Derry City were, were not out of the relegation problems themselves but it was two all 
Go United went up the pitch to get what looked like the winner in a massive game. Liam Coyle, who could barely run at this stage, was like probably about 34, basically did this mazy run, took on three or four Go United players, couldn't run because of his knees and curled it into the top corner. And some of the Go United fans would start to clap. It's like, you were absolute genius. And like, I had the pleasure of, of being in the old Brandywell watching Liam Coyle walk around the pitch and just run games. And uh, what a talent. What type, of, what type of player was he? Um, you see, he was the type of player he was was because he couldn't move. So it was like if you, it's like we're talking about the the lads playing Astro who like they're just so far ahead of you that they don't move but they can they have a touch. Like he was a goal scorer, but he was also like he was part of that Derry City revival when they came into the League of Ireland. Um, but he, he I, I forget the, the injury he had, but it was a serious career ending type injury. And he became a goal scorer, like a number 10. Didn't move that much because he couldn't. Amazing touch, like amazing touch, mm-hmm. amazing... Um, like ability. Van Nistelrooy, like the touch, not very mobile or like a finisher? Like Van Nistelrooy was like a Ferrari compared to him being a, a tractor. Like he really could not move very well at all. Like he really, like his mobility was bad. And I, I would have seen... Agricultural footballer. Yeah. I would have seen him later on in his life, but he was, he um his touch and vision and just like, you could just see, and I remember watching him in, in Lansdowne Road in a little pre-season friendly in the late 90s where he was playing Newcastle uh, and even at that level you could see he's totally in his zone here and uh, any Derry City fan listening in or League of Ireland fan of that genre will know exactly what I'm talking about like one of the greatest talents I've ever seen in the League of Ireland and um, still heavily involved I think in in, in uh, the Maiden City as well and uh, yeah what a what a player I was it was one of those moments where you're absolutely gutted as a fan but at the same time you're kind of like you see some of those old goal of the month Matt Letizia is where he got that goal against Blackburn and you just see a few people behind yeah. the goal. Just it's like, um, I was at the, when Monon played Kerry in Super 8 and David Clifford scored the last minute goal and I was gutted but you're like, okay, yeah. fair enough. What I'm, do you do? You're, I'm Jesus. watching greatness here. You yeah, know? you nearly, even though it's against your team, you kind of have to mm. uh, appreciate it. He made a Northern Irish cap, Liam Coyle as well, I think. He um, scored an FAI Cup final winner um, in Talca around that time and um, he, so he would have played until... He finished up until he only finished up the following season. So I was lucky enough to see him. He'd, he'd been two spells at Derry City at that stage, three spells at Derry City, <laughs> four spells at Derry City. If Wikipedia is right, but one hundred percent would have gone. Which to, it always is right, of course. Yeah, would have would have played in the would have played in the old English first division, no doubt whatsoever. He was that talented. Yeah, fair play, Liam Coyle in the books as your second pick. On you had to be there, Johnny. We're going to number three now. In this is uh, a little bit different. It's a little bit different, but uh, nobody will be surprised to see that there's a, a racing pick in there. Twenty twelve. At York, the Judd Mount, wasn't it? Frankel. Yeah, um, there he is. Look at him. <laughs> He's a beautiful horse, in fairness. So Galileo would have had... Galileo, the beauty of horse racing, which is kind of... Uh, how do you differentiate between, sorry, a beautiful horse? So if, if a different horse popped up there that wasn't so beautiful, like how, what's, uh, what, what I, makes I'd a beautiful be terrible, horse? I'd be a terrible judge. So, like, I, I mean, I'm working at Is it the, the white part on the... He he well, he'd physically and in fairness Galileo so Galileo would have like the white kind of strike the stripe and that's um he's put that in a lot of his stock and the one thing about racing that's quite unique that I love about it compared to like you know field sports is that I remember his father I remember his mother you're exactly like your father <laughs> and I remember like Galileo uh, and Galileo spawned Frankel Galileo passed away recently and Frankel is now the main stallion pretty much um but Frankel was a little bit like as Aidan O'Brien said was a little bit of his mind he was a little bit like hot mm. and he, the, his stock are still showing that but Pat Healy the photographer he, he basically nearly threw me out of the press room in Mallow the other day for suggesting that Frankel might be better than See the Stars because I saw See the Stars winning in Leopardstown I saw him winning the Ark and that would have been a close second but when Frankel won that day um, I'm going back now by seven lengths seven lengths so this was the I suppose the, the main reason I, I put this in was this was the only time I saw Frankel and he was stepping up to uh, an extended mile and two having been running all his races were over a mile or less and he was so 10 furlongs for the first time yeah and he was sent off 1 to 10 like you know so I mean to have that sort of a bet about a horse that's like clearly amazing but like stepping up and trip and say Nicholas Abbey I remember I backed St Nicholas Abbey to finish second to him or to finish in the first two or something and St Nicholas Abbey was an amazing horse won the Breeders' Cup um, and had this kind of a sad death himself Frankel went by him as if like honestly as if he was just a statue and won by seven lengths um, I'm just looking at the ratings here it was his. It was. It was given as his joint best ever performance. The other one was when he won at Ascot when he beat Acceleration, um, 
and then he went on and won at Ascot so he, he, he ran 14 times won 14 times and I have to say he was probably the best horse I've ever seen like see the stars kept doing it and did it over different trips maybe he was better than him but see the stars would never win really like that so you're kind of it's a little bit apples and oranges mm. but now I go racing and Frankel, is produ- Frankel himself had the winner of the arc this year in Alpinista so that continuation is one of the beauties of racing and today in Thurlis I'll go in and I'll remember the dad of such a horse winning or something like that and Frankel is still to me the best ever and York was a great night out as well by the way Jesus right? it's a great city yeah um, you know medieval kind of city yeah really really cool and a lot of Irish over there that day and uh, English racing is kind of struggling for to get attendances now but there was no struggle that day so Frankel 2012 Judmont um, the greatest horse Johnny Ward has ever seen number three in the books of you had to be there the next one Johnny uh, as a Galway man another special one for you but 2017 All-Ireland Senior Hurling Championship semi-final everyone will, rem- will remember this for Joe Canning's moment uh, on the touchline Tipperary against Galway yeah I like again there, there's, there are so many uh, examples of Joe you could have picked out um, I seem to remember watching his championship debut against Cork when he single-handedly nearly won the game I think that was his championship debut I seem to recall watching that in in a bar in, in Dublin so I wasn't there and there were Joe probably had Joe did have better performances than this um, but I'm from um, I'm from a, a football part of Galway effectively Ballygar Hurling Club is my local club and it's making great uh, strides but a lot of the um, exponents of hurling in the area would have been like blow-ins from like mm-hmm. the likes of say Kiltormer or Tipperary I'm thinking <laughs> of the Harkins and the Lynches but the Lynches Damien Lynch was effectively my best friend when I was in national school Damien Lynch's dad was Joe Canning's uh, uncle right. so Damien and Niall of course were, were very good at hurling because uh, PJ was from I think Kiltormer so we had this always this talk about the Cannings the Cannings then I started watching Ollie play and like Ollie was my favourite hurler. Like he was, he played. He ended up playing cornerback, but he was, he was could have played anywhere. The most amazing stick work. So unlucky not to win a senior uh, county all Ireland. And um, but then this lad Joe comes along, and you're like, you know, in terms of sporting tragedies, if Joe doesn't win an all Ireland, like <laughs> this would be an absolute tragedy. And they went into that game against Water in 2017, where you know they gave away two sloppy goals, and you're like, is this going to happen all over again? That was one, that was probably the most emotional I've ever been after um, a sporting event because really. I was just like the hardship of watching Galway coming so close and in 2012 when uh, it started out uh, I think when we hammered Leinster Kilkenny in the Leinster final and Andy Cunningham and brought this level of professionalism I think that culminated then in Michal Dunahu, um taking them there and you, you remember Michal Dunahu meeting his dad crossing oh. the bridge like the, that sort of stuff where you know there's just so much going on in a picture and not to mind the, the scene itself but Joe Canning like as I said I was useless at hurling like absolutely useless useless at golf useless with a stick in my hand but I loved hurling still love hurling and that day I was watching uh, I remember I was wearing like these these shades and my shades fell down uh, the into before. the next tier like when Joe got that point and that point like I had a terrible view of it I was basically in the Hogan and I had an awful view of it but when Joe got the ball that day and he looked up and you're like this is a total 100 to 1 Hail Mary but he's probably going to get it and you see him and the, just the noise in the place and the emotion you forget then the bubbles went down the other end and had a Chance. probably more strikeable probably more strikeable but off his left I think that went wide and meanwhile, my shades were still down in the in the bottom tier, like they were down the tier below me. I wasn't asking, and then everyone was celebrating afterwards. And I started, I threw my program down at this lad, trying to aim it at his head. By the way, <laughs> you see those uh, pair of personal or whatever, you wouldn't mind like uh, throwing them up to me. And he did, but uh, oh my god, that that was like. There's some days you come off a pitch and even watching hurling, and you're just like you're not right after. Mm. That was one of them. Johnny's red bands in the Hogan stand. Uh, yeah, yeah. Purcell actually, and Purcell, I, I lost some subsequently as well. Ah, no way. Sorry, Johnny. Sorry, Joe. Um, five, five minutes into stoppage time. I, I mean, and you talk with a photo with uh, Neil Dunham and his father, but photo of Joe as well. Photo of Joe. I mean, and I think one sports Smile, file, yeah. photo it's of like, the year maybe. He's he's like. <laughs> It was probably early enough into the shot because the player knows himself yeah. if he's going over or not fairly early. It's just pure, the biggest, widest smile you'll ever see on a player on a pitch. And he knows, he knows well before anyone that this is going straight over the black spot. And Tip, Tip played an unbelievable role that day in, in a game that literally was going either way. And you're talking about fine margins. Tip win that day, maybe Galway would still be uh, having not won All-Ireland uh, Championship. But like where Yates speaks about like how can you tell the dancer from the dance. Like when Joe has a hurl in his hand 
And when you when when I watched Joe and he he collect the ball, just look and this flu, fluidity of motion and fluency of everything that he did, just the most gifted natural hurler. Where he is in the pantheon of the greats with TJ and DJ and um, you know Henry, who's now our manager, obviously, and mm-hmm. and and even Christy Ring, if you want to go back that far, I don't know. There, there may not be. Um, a correct answer but I'll never watch a hurler and get the same feeling as I did as watching Joe Canning and we could have done with him in the second half against Limerick last yeah, year tell you this what. year uh, so Galway 22 points tip only 18 the All-Ireland semi-final of 2017 and Joe Canning's great point five minutes into stoppage time that's Johnny's fourth pick on you had to be there final one Johnny another one special for, for you tribes men and women um, All-Ireland football final of this year I was at the game myself with my dad a Galway man Kerry Galway. Like, what, so what was your perspective when you're watching like the two sharpshooters of that? Uh, Walsh was Walsh was uh, even I had Gavin White sitting in that seat you're in on Saturday. Um one of the Kerry defenders in the day, All Star. And he just said he was unplayable. Mm. Uh, like the Kerry lads were looking around at each other going. Like he said at one point that when he kicked one of the scores in the second half from the from the sideline, he was just like what what are you supposed to do? Because the defenders were doing everything right. Mm. They were pushing you're supposed to push the players out to the sideline, try and put them on his bad foot, doing everything you can physically do as a as a as a defender to stop him, but he couldn't be stopped. It was just one of those performances from Shane Walsh where you're like, ah, look at and and one of those performances where you're like, I know Clifford got man of the match and maybe I, I disagreed strongly with well, that. Well, of course again. Walsh was man of the match. But I know and I know they have to they probably feel entitled to give the man of the match to the winning team because they're going to be in the hotel and handing out the awards on television that evening. So I get that po- that point of it. But if ever you're going to have a year where you throw the rule book out, I mean, Shane Walsh was the man of the match in the All Ireland final this year. Yeah, and um, you know you'd forget in the in the Armagh game where like he was amazing for so much of the game, and then like Shane would sometimes be prone to the the odd thing maybe that like he should have done something a little bit simpler in the game and that, I mean that Armagh game was absolutely bonkers <laughs> and Shane gave a terrible terrible cross field ball that yes. to, like yeah. the last goal I think so again sliding doors moments that was penalties so that this could never have been written but like I don't know what you can say about this lad I think he was probably given far too much criticism over the move to Dublin um, you know there's, we spoke to Lee Keegan I know Shane Kilcarn and Bernard aren't at that level but there's an awful lot of commitment and then the travel and all that um, and I know I'm I'm in touch with some of the Nace lads ahead of the game on Saturday and like at least they don't have Paul Mannion to deal with but they do have Shane Walsh to deal with so they didn't want the transfer to happen but like how can you teach somebody to be that good in left and right foot from all sorts of distances all sorts of ranges all sorts of angles in a game with so much pressure on it and he didn't deserve to lose the game obviously no. but you're, ta- you're you know when you're taking on possibly the greatest footballer ever in David Clifford you're like well okay I can I can put my hands up here and say I you know as funny as a Galway fan I was at like the Limerick game the Hurling this year um I was at more or less all championship games the Limerick game the Hurling and the Kerry game and I was never as kind of less disappointed coming off a big game like that because the Limerick Hurling game had everything and their Limerick are exceptional and Galway pretty much left everything on the pitch and the Kerry game was kind of the same mm. and I was the, I was I've never actually watched the game back because I don't tend to watch games back when Galway lose yeah fair enough um it's maybe a strange thing I, I probably didn't I don't think even watched the Sunday game maybe I did but I certainly didn't watch the game back so I'd have to watch back again to remember I'm going on the memory of Shane Walsh that day I'll never forget the awe when you're watching this like oh my god how can you do this like and He's only getting going, really, hopefully. Yeah, and it's madness because Tom O'Sullivan, Dingle man, Kerry man, had an unbelievable year for Kerry this year. Unbelievable. <laughs> and and yet he had the the, just the unluck of Mark and Shane Walsh in the final and didn't get an all-star. Mm. Like, Tom O'Sullivan must be one of the best. It must have had one of the best years for anyone who hasn't picked up an all-star. And it's definitely down to the final. Mm. And and he's so unlucky because he had the nerve to, to pick up Shane Walsh yeah. uh, in the first place. But nobody could have marked Shin Walsh that day, so you feel sorry for Thomas Sullivan. What do Nace do now on, on Sunday? It's ah. like, well, Nace are, I think, like, Nace are maybe four point underdogs or something like that, but their Nace are in with a chance, like last year, Mannion was playing, and um, Mannion got injured then, and you're thinking, this is amazing, but what do, what do you do at club level? Ah, like, so do you. Do you change your style to 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 stop him at a county level? It's I think the other thing is that that Kerry Galway game. As much as there were elements of the defensive game in it, it was never going to be anything other than a restoration of the beauty of football. Yeah. When you see Walsh and 
like pound for pound two of the most talented sportsmen like you'll see in this country <laughs> possibly two of the most talented Gaelic footballers ever I mean, yeah. what they're doing because the game's always improving Shane Walsh to have that ability off his wrong foot is just staggering to me like you know, and I'm sure he's had an impact on young players as well but there's probably kids who have been starting practice both feet 100%. kicking points and it's such an important skill but Shane Walsh has just highlighted how important it is at the top level Clifford does it as well but I mean imperious Shane Walsh that day Johnny great stuff that was your fifth and final pick um, so that is Johnny's you had to be there in the books it's so unexpected it's one of those you had to be there moments you had to be there it subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life I had to be there 